Volume 15 of High School DxD is, I would say, a collection of many different side stories. Much like the previous volumes, there is lots of little side stories. None of these are in the anime, so there isn't any sort of like backtracking or forward, etc. like that, that would confuse people. This is all original stories that do go on in previous volumes that are timelined up, and I will put a note to where all the timelines are for each sort of little mini segment and story and chapter for those that do decide to read volume 15. But this is a volume that's, you know, got many side stories in it. And then at the end of the volume, there is a lot of continuation of the story with, you know, Rias and Kiba out in the sort of vampire kingdom. And there's some interesting backstories as well. Those are the stories I found the best, but I'll get into those after. The first side story is, I would say, about magical girls. And of course, a lovely favorite magical girl that we know and love from the anime. And of course, the light novels wanting to be a magical girl and adopting her sister into this, getting Rias, getting the whole gang involved to wanting to become a magical girl. And that's what I just love about this. Not because of them, because of Miltan. I'm just saying it. Miltan is hilariously weird. And I was so happy to see him return. I never thought I'd see that man again, or magical girl again, because apparently he is a magical girl. I mean, they go from this whole audition, they get attacked by the magicians or the witches, and everything goes wrong. But Miltan is like a boss. Like, this magical girl, man, can, you know, crush cars. It's just the power that this person possesses is astronomical. And he went from nothing more than just this innocent, weak bystander that wanted to be a magical girl, you know, in the first season of High School DxD, being like, you know, turn me into a magical girl. And he is a magical girl. Like, I loved it. It was hilarious just reading that and seeing Miltan in it. I didn't expect to see Miltan again. And I'm so happy to see him again. I just found him so funny because it shows that, you know, the most minute characters get a little bit of extra love. No matter how insignificant they are, a little bit of extra love is just what I actually loved about this chapter in particular. Because Miltan's just, I don't know, very weird. As you can tell, you know, a full grown man that's an absolute titan in size wanting to be a magical girl. And they went in for an audition and everything and they were passing through it and hey, good on for him. And then he just disappears and you know, you could see that they were kind of like, yeah, he kind of possesses a bit of power that's a bit weird, you know? Obviously he's a magical girl now. So I love that chapter. I thought it was absolutely hilarious. And of course I look forward to seeing more of Miltan. But I mean, the whole thing with that was just them auditioning to become a magical girl, them just being attacked by, you know, the wizards and magicians and whatever you want to call them, and then everything just going wrong from there, and then they had to wipe everyone's memory, and it just kind of showed that they were constantly on their tails, so it's a bit of a fun fluff story. But then after that, you know, we've got some interesting stuff going on with Akuno's backstory. Now, this is the one thing I really was looking forward to. It's what I really love. The backstories, you know, for Kiba and Akano are just the two sort of moments that I really love. And Akano being my favorite girl, I was really happy to see her get that extra backstory. Because it shows that, you know, as much as things went wrong for her and her father and they were going to execute her and the people in that sort of clan or group were going to do horrible things to her and kill her. You know, the people sort of in charge were putting things in motion to try and save her and get her away from harm's way. And the same with Kiba, it showed that Rias has such a soft and gentle side, you know, bringing all these people in, even though they may not have potential, it showed that Rias was just a very gentle and kind-hearted person back then. That also being said, there's definitely some very horrible things going on with those groups of individuals. Obviously the politics, you know, the crossbreeding and all that. And, you know, Azazel trying to help out in the background. You know, Azazel and obviously her father have got a lot of history. And Azazel trying to put some things in place to help her. It just showed that even though, yes, they're seen as bad people, there's obviously a lot of stuff they've done wrong. It's all, you know, different shades of how you see it, you know. At the end of the day, there's these big wars that have gone on, but they're all just individuals with their own dreams and aspirations, their own problems going on amongst their own races and clans and 
you know, governing groups, etc. And so it was really cool to see, you know, Arkano's backstory with her father and seeing her father and Azazel and all those trying to help, but of course showing that they don't have as much power because there are certain sort of stigmas, you know, crossbreeding and humans and fallen angels and angels and demons and all the rest. Just, there's this constant sort of prejudice against each other and seeing those walls slowly shatter is quite an interesting thing to see unfold throughout the light novel series. So Arkano's story I feel like doesn't just tell her backstory but it gives a bit more of an insight into the different layers going on between you know the devil society and of course the fallen angels and of course the humans and how the humans are more just the sort of a you know the cheese inside of a sandwich they're just wedged in amongst this constant tug of war which is still quite nice and then when it comes to Kiba Kiba's is so much more grimmer like, I really feel sorry for him. Even though, yes, Arkanos is quite grim, but Kiba's is just messed up. Like, this whole holy organization going on, testing and experimenting and doing horrific things. And even to the very end, Kiba still has faith in them. I can see why he's very bitter about everything that's transpired within that organization, because there is definitely a lot of brainwashing and manipulating that goes on in there. And Kiba really thinks the best of them right up until the end. I mean, Riz brings him in, you know, makes him a devil, and feeds him, clothes him, and even has someone teach him sword skills, which I loved. I loved the fact that, you know, they were teaching him sword skills. Still is very skeptical, you know. He tries to sort of fight back and realizing slowly that things aren't as what they seem, the devils aren't as evil, and that's where he realizes, you know, he's been told his entire life that, you know, these demons, they're horrible, the devils, they do all these horrible things, they're just gonna inflict harm and they should never be trusted and then realizing well actually no they're quite nice people and realizing again as i said before with arkano there's all these different walls and prejudice and hatred between all these different groups but at the end of the day they're just many different groups and factions that have done good and bad things and they're all just trying to overcome and seeing those walls go break down is quite nice and seeing kiva get some sword training kind of shows how he built those skills up and then of course seeing our lovely little cat girl and seeing how shy and timid she was back then and then Kiba kind of scaring her a little bit it just shows that quite beautiful sort of build up for Kiba and then of course Akano at that point was part of the group so it kind of went in a nice order Akano's backstory went first and then Kiba's and then it showed that Akano joined Rias first and then it was Kiba's I would like to see Konako's at some point but I feel like that is probably going to come at some point again as i say in every volume i haven't read anything beyond this so it's all fresh and new for me but after those backstories you know you've got some stuff going on you know when it came to keeper's backstory that was right at the end but i kind of want to put those two together because they were both backstories that were sort of close in touch with each other but other stuff that was kind of going on when it came to the side stories was of course some fun stuff with you know the gang or the female group going out and getting Issei a gift and then of course them getting lost in this grand big city they act like it's so big and mysterious and it just kind of shows that they're kind of a little bit sheltered when it comes to what's going on out there and that's still really fun and interesting and of course our lovely fallen angels and demons and all that sort of interacting amongst each other but the best part is our angel little friend buying a rice cooker like that was just hilarious. I just found that funny then. She had to ring up Michael and she said, He's the greatest because he let me buy a rice cooker. I just, I don't know. I just felt that was really weird but funny. And I love the way they didn't even know what they were buying for Ize. And we all know Ize. It was something raunchy. And then them realizing at the end when they got it, yeah, it was not what they thought it was. They thought it was something like really rare and powerful and something. And then it was just, yeah, raunchy stuff. That was really fun, and then seeing, you know, Zenobia sort of interact with some boys trying to hit on her, and then they'd be like, oh, this is the first time a guy's ever tried to hit on me, her, you know, kick some booty, and then Argia being all shy and timid. I mean, I love Argia. She is always sweet and timid. I look forward to her coming out of her shell, but again, them getting hit on by guys and sleazy ones at that. I, I mean, that was bound to happen as soon as you go out into public and girls being of their caliber. Yeah, you're going to bump into some sleazy guys. And then seeing, you know, Zenovia kick them to the curb is just, mwah, 
absolute mint as. After they get the gift, they go back home. Akano goes out, sees her father, and sort of does the whole, oh yeah, we're gonna go out to the secret base of a lovely Azazel. I love the secret base that's going on, because there's some weird stuff going on in there. And then they try to put Gasper in a box and give him like weird weapons and missiles and all that kind of stuff. That was just like weird and wonkos but the the best part is kind of like that, that backstory that backstory leads up to kind of you know Akano seeing her father buying a lunch saying hey we got a parent thing going on you should go etc it's quite interesting the thing though that I will note I've left this to the end there is some weird stuff her father was into I just want to note that he's weird he was into some SMN she cracked the whip I find it weird, okay? It's fine to be into that stuff, but his own daughter was doing that kind of weird stuff to him, and it was like reminiscing his emotions and feelings about her mother and everything. I was just like, this is just weird. She's just cracking the whip on her dad and he's enjoying it. That was, okay, that was a bit weird, but still funny nonetheless. And then Azazel's just kind of like, oh yeah, yeah. And then he gets the whip as well, and yeah, everything just went crazy. It was still really funny though. But a little bit weird. And then Issei's just like a bystander. is just like, okay, I need to get out of here. But the best part is Gasper getting weird rockets in a box. And then enhancing their abilities. It obviously shows that Azazel is still trying to learn and grow. And build this sort of establishment of trying to understand more of the boosted gear itself. And all the stuff going on. And there was definitely some talk about the dragons itself. You know, we get to see a little bit more of Volley himself. And I think that's what I find interesting. You know, we get to see a little bit more of Volley. We get to see some of his motives. He interacts with Rius a little bit. That stuff going on. Then, of course, you know, Rius, Riv, you know, Kiba out there interacting with the vampires, discussing and negotiating stuff that's going on. All that different stuff going on. And that's where they talk about the backstory, so that's where the backstory part sort of evolves with Kiba. But I feel like the most important part for that particular segment is just Volley going over the whole mysterious dragons reappearing, all this stuff sort of transpiring. The Obviously the big end game of what these villains have got planned. There is obviously something big and grand planned by the villains, the evil people, puppeting everything and orchestrating all these events so i'm interested to see where that goes i'm interested to see how volley deals with it because volley is always about trying to find a greater bigger challenge and then their booster gear dealing with what their dreams are i mean isei's booster gear is still dealing with isei being in love with opai volley's obsession with fighting people there's that interesting stuff that they've got to overcome and the final thing is my beautiful girl li fei pendragon and her getting the possibility of getting contracted by Issei and then doing that interview. I mean, that wasn't too much that went on there, but I was really happy. I was really looking forward to seeing Lefei possibly getting that contract. I, I think we all know that's going to happen, and that's what I want to see, because I love Lefei. She is so cute. For a wizard, I love her. So I'm really happy to see that kind of move forward, and I want to see more of her. Because I think her potential is just absolutely adorable, and I'm fairly sure we'll see more of her. So again... I'd love to know your thoughts in the comment section down below. What do you like about this volume? Who's your favourite girl? Who did you like in this volume? Who stood out the most? And which of the backstories did you like the most? And what did you like about the backstories between Akano and, of course, Kiba? So again, love to know your thoughts in the comment section down below. If you like this video, hit the like button, subscribe for more anime content, and I'll see you beautiful nerds in the next video.